Hi everyone. Uh, quick administrative point, as well as Django 1.11 being released yesterday, there were also security releases for all currently supported versions of Django. This includes a security vulnerability in login redirecting, so probably affects pretty much everybody. Definitely worth going and updating your site soon. Well, about 40 minutes, please. Right, so I'm going to talk to you today about some weird and wonderful things to do with the RRM, which is, I think is quite an appropriate topic. The RRM is kind of weird because databases are weird. Um, and it's also kind of wonderful because you don't have to write SQL. There we go, done. <laughs> Let's have the full version of this. So, hi, I'm Mark Tamlin. I'm a Django Core developer. Uh, this is my sixth DjangoCon Europe. So I've been here a while. Um, most, those of you who use Contrib Postgres have almost certainly used some code that I've written. I've done various bits and pieces around the rest of Django as well, been to more sprints than I care to think about. Um, I'm also employed as the technical lead at PhotoCrowd. So all of these lovely photos that you see are from PhotoCrowd. Uh, if you have any interest in photography or you work for a business that has interest in photography, I would be very interested to speak to you on that note. So. We have a talk in three acts today. Um, we're going to start off with some interesting ways to query your data, um, and then look at encapsulating some model logic, and then some interesting approaches to prefetching. Um, in order to talk about parts of the RM which are, or techniques using the RM, you require a sufficiently complicated setup to actually make this worth it. You can't really do this with a to-do list app, uh, because all of the relationships are really obvious, and there's not really anything clever to do when you've got a very simple project. So in true programmer style, we're having a car analogy. Um, so let's suppose that we are working for Alfa Romeo, and we are building a, car a new car dealership administration system that they're going to use in all their dealerships across Italy. So you've got, new use, you've got new car sales, you've got used car sales, you've got servicing, you've got repairs, you've got people who work in the mechanics department, you've got salespeople, you've got receptionists who you know, like check the cars in and out. So there's lots and lots of complex processes that all need to be recorded properly so that they can track the performance of their staff and then can make sure all the right jobs get done in the right order and everything's nice and clear and understood and we don't have mountains of dead trees everywhere. There is a lot of deliberate naivety in this system. Um, please think about the way that I'm using techniques to query parts of the RRM or to work with your models and the database rather than worrying about the detail. Almost all of these examples could probably have been done better in a different way in this case. But if I actually came up with a system that you needed this, it would probably be far too complicated to actually explain. So some straightforward models, we've got departments, we've got employees, we've got customers. Um, there's a core point here, which is that we're not going to have a vehicle model. If we were working for something at this size, we would have millions of vehicles that we'd know about. And we'd also need a bunch of information if they're new, and a bunch of information if they're a currently used one that we're trying to sell, and a bunch of information if they belong to a customer. And actually, the information that's shared in the middle is quite small. So we're going to have a, we'll probably have an abstract base model that will share that small number of fields, because what we don't want to be doing is every time we want to query anything about a used vehicle, joining a 500,000 row used vehicle table with a 7 million row vehicle table in order to present any information, joins on that scale will be slow. So we're going to have new vehicles, used vehicles, owned vehicles, and when a vehicle changes hands, it moves from one table to another. We're also going to have a task model, which we'll come to a bit later. Um, this is basically somebody does something to a car. Straightforwards. And the, there would obviously be lots of small other models around the system to deal with complex processes as and when they happen. So, Act 1. A short lesson on UK registration plates. So here are some regular expressions that describe the last few registration plates for cars in the UK. 
Again, naivety, we're not dealing with people who have custom registration plates here. But let's suppose that we're trying to do something in a naive sense that gets me all the cars that were manufactured in 2010. Well, so a registration plate, if you went and bought a car now, is two characters, two word characters, two letters, and then 17, and then three letters. If you bought it this time last year, it'll be two letters, 16, and then three letters. I hope you can spot the plan here. Um, but because there aren't enough letters, um, we decided to write a 50-year plan that would work up just up until 2050. And if you buy it in the second half of the year, then you add 50 to the year number. So if you bought it in October last year, you'd get two letters, 66, and then three letters. So, but we don't, we don't really care about whether it was the first half of the year or the last half of the year, so we want to do something like this. We want to do useVehicle.Object.Filter registration plate year is 2007. In fact, this double underscore year is kind of deliberately chosen because it looks exactly the same as it would do if we had a date field here instead. So, we're going to define a custom lookup. This is all documented stuff that you can do with the IRM. So here is our registration plate lookup at least the first part of it. We need to give it a lookup name, uh, which is going to be year. That's the string that we're going to have after the double underscore. We're going to have an as SQL method. Uh, now, the as SQL method takes a couple of things called the compiler and the connection. Connections will be quite familiar to you. The compiler is an internal part of the RM which deals with building things up, building up the actual query. In this case, you basically don't actually have to use it at all, so it's fine. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to process the left-hand side using the built-in process LHS method. This will return the SQL and the arguments that we want on the left-hand side. And then we're going to do some horribly naive code for two lines here, which will extract the two, let the two characters from the end of the string representation of the year, and then we'll turn that back into an integer and add 50 and turn it back into a string, and then we'll get our two parameters that we want. So if we passed in 2007, we'd get the string 07 and the string 57. Great. Lovely. Obviously, this would need a whole ton of error handling code in the real world. So we can now return something. The return value is slightly esoteric. You return a SQL string, and you return some, a list of arguments. So here, this is Postgres dialect. Um, so we're returning the left-hand side regular expression matches the first version with a, with a 0, 07 in the middle. And then the second half matches um, so or, again, the left-hand side matching something with this 57 in the middle. And then we're going to return the left-hand side arguments twice, because the left-hand side SQL appears twice in the SQL string. So it's always front, front to left. And then as the compiler works through, it builds up one step, one little look up, and then it builds up the next little bit, and it builds up the next little bit. And eventually, you end up with a big, long SQL string and a big, long list of arguments. And it passes that off to your database adapter, Psycho PG2 in this case, and you get back results. Finally, we're going to need to register the lookup to the field, which we do like this. Um, you can actually use a, um, at the decorator syntax in order to do this as well on your lookup if you want to. And we're just going to use a plain car field for the moment, because that's fine. Um, and then we can query it. Hooray! And you see we've got back some cars that have 0, 07 plates, and we've got cars that have got 6, 07 plates. Now, if you actually wanted to do this, like, what's the point of doing this? I could have just written some code that did it. Well, yes, but you might want to do this query in a whole bunch of places, and you might want to put in some, some sensible additional validation logic. So if you try and get the cars that were made in the year 27, then you probably meant chariots instead of cars, because didn't have many cars in 27. OK. further lessons on UK registration plates. Before 2001, we had a different system, where you had a letter at the beginning which determined which year the car was manufactured in, or half year the car was manufactured in. And then you had three num well, two or three numbers, and then you had three letters. And then, so you started with Z in 2001, and then you go back to Y in the first half of 2001, and then you keep going back. And if you get back too far, and you get back to the mid-80s, then the letter moves to the other end, and it swaps over. So and we want to be able to order all of these registration plates by when they were created. 
So really, we want to be able to do something like this. So we're now using the expressions API. We want to order the used vehicles by the plate year descending. Looks fairly nice and simple. You can imagine using this in code, and it'll all work beautifully. The good news is that we have the technology to do this. Uh, I can write this quite nicely like this. Um, there's a lot of dot, dot, dots in this, because there's a lot of detail missing. I could thought about writing out the full version of this code, but one, I decided I couldn't be bothered, um, and two, it would probably be about 100 lines long because of all the different regular expressions and so on that you've got to process. Um, but in theory, this would work. You have a case when statement. For those who might not be familiar with case when, it's basically if and elif in the database. Um, and you say, when a certain condition is true, then return a certain value. When some other conditions are true, return a certain value. And then eventually, you have to provide a default at the end in case none of those conditions are true. And then you've created a little value for each row in the database, and you can order by it. Again, this is going to be woefully inefficient if you don't index it, but fine. It'll do. So we could write an expression that created all of this SQL, or we can cheat. Uh, so let's just cheat and have a function called plate year, which returns the expression that we want. Done. Lovely. So that's your lookup API and your expression API. Um, there's also transforms, which are like lookups, but only affect one side. Um, and these all use a similar sort of as SQL pattern. If you wanted to define an expression, you do the same thing. They have the ability to do different vendor support. All of this is beautifully documented and hopefully is familiar to a lot of you. It allows you to produce things that look and feel like Django that don't do things that Django provides. And Django's provided things like a like double underscore I exact for a very, very long time. But you can create your own versions that do that sort of thing without having to fall back to everybody's favorite friend, the extra query, or worse, raw SQL. Actually, I'm not sure which of those is worse. Probably an extra query. OK, act two, encapsulating logic. Let's suppose that we're building the part of the system where you're going to sell a used vehicle. Now, there's lots of different ways that used vehicles processes get sold. You might be doing a cash sale where someone's basically coming with a briefcase full of cash and says, there you go, there's your 6,000 euros, I'll have a car, please. OK, great. That's nice and easy. There's not much complexity to handle there. But they might have an old car that they're part exchanging, and you've got to get a valuation for the car, and then you've got to take that valuation off, and you've got to record where the, where the car had come from and set up a bunch of checks that are going to create a new used vehicle for the part exchange car that you brought in. Or you might be doing a higher purchase, where you've got to run credit checks on the individual and work out what their monthly repayment rate is going to be and do a whole load of complex things here. So we could start writing a nice model level API that looks like this. You've got a common utility that says you know, complete purchase. So that's going to move the vehicle from a used vehicle to an owned vehicle and set the customer up properly. And there we go. Everything is all done and signed off and boxes ticked. And then we can add the specific things that we need. So we've got perform credit check, we've got perform part exchange, process the part exchange. And you can see that this list is going to grow very rapidly. Um, I have worked on a project where someone had done this, and there were approximately 130 methods on one model. And about 50% of them didn't apply to most instances of that model made it very, very difficult, especially when one of, you know, if we now stop supporting part exchanges, which code do we get rid of? It's kind of hard to tell. And all of these methods have got like, oh, if the process is this, then we can do this. And if not, then we've got to do this. And there's lots of if statements, lots of case statements, lots of error handling, lots of oh, raising an error because it's not the right kind of post transaction. So you can't, you can't perform a credit check if you're doing a cash sale, because why would you bother? You've got the cash in your hand. So you need to raise an error in that case and handle that somewhere else. And it's all complicated. So it would be nicer if we had something like this. So you, you access vehicle.transaction, and you get back a object that has just the methods that are relevant to the type of transaction that you're doing. 
So you can see we've got a complete purchase method on both of these, but when we're doing a higher purchase, we get the perform credit check. When we're doing a part exchange, you get the process part exchange, and you have just the two versions that you're trying, just the methods and just the interactivity and just the properties that you need. Now, it might be quite easy to just do this by making vehicle.transactions a property, and it looks some things up, and you get the information that you need, but that's boring, so we're not going to do that. We're going to write a custom field, which is going to store an identifying string for the type of transaction in the database, you know, just in a car field. And when I access it, I'm going to get a bound instance of a class back that's bound to the vehicle that I'm working on. So here's our base class. It's very straightforward. It's got our complete transaction method here, which is common to all the different things that we want. And it gets initialized with a vehicle. This is quite a nice little simple Python API that you pass a vehicle to, and then you can do stuff transaction-wise on the vehicle. Lovely. Nice and easy to test, nice and easy to work with. Then we can have a, a concrete subclass. So here's our higher purchase. It's subclasses from base transaction. We're going to define a slug on it, which is going to be the identifying string that we need in the database. And then we're going to do a, you know, add all the methods that are specific to higher purchasing, like performing a credit check. If you've got a bunch of things here, this base class is great, because you can add a bunch of not implemented error methods, a method that just raises not implemented error, and you've got nice sort of self-documenting code that shows that, okay, I'm implementing a new type of transaction, so I need to do this, 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 and this. Also, if we now stop, oper stop offering higher purchases, you can look for all the methods that are, uh, that are on higher purchase through the rest of your code base and go, okay, so that bit of code can go away, that bit of code can go away, along with the main higher purchase class that we're dealing with, and then write some migrations to handle what happens historically. So we're now going to need a field. It's basically a car field, and we can't be bothered to pass a max length to a transaction type field, because that doesn't really feel right. So we'll set the default to be 100, because if you're writing slugs longer than 100 characters to read, something's got a bit skewy. Now, the field needs to pass data into the database, and it needs to be able to get the information back. So let's deal with passing it in. So this is done by a function called get prep value. It has a friend called get db prep value, which also takes some other parameters like the connection so that you can do different behavior depending on your type of database. But in this case, it's nice and easy. All we're doing is returning the slug belonging to the class. Getting it back is a little bit more complicated because what we want to get is an instance of higher purchase attached to the vehicle. So there's a function called from db value which is the one that's called the other way back. And for those of you who wrote custom fields a very long time ago, this wouldn't exist, but it exists from about Django 1.7, I think. Um, so from DB value is passed a value from exactly what you get out of the database. So in this case, it's going to either be a string or it's going to be none. But at this point, the only thing that we know is that the value is the, the only, the only context that we have is the context belonging to the field. We don't have the instance of the model yet, so we can't instantiate a higher purchase object because we don't have a vehicle. So we're going to use a Python construct called descriptor. Who's actually ever written a descriptor before? I'm not seeing, I'm seeing one hand waving in the back there. Oh, there's about half a dozen. Good. Who actually doesn't know what a descriptor is? Yep, yep, that's lots of hands. Good. Um, descriptors, it turns out, are really easy. And this code is also how foreign key works. Um, when you access a foreign key field, you actually access a descriptor, which looks at the object ID and goes and loads an object from the database. That's how we can do complex, ac complex activity just by accessing an attribute. A lot of you are probably familiar with double underscore get item, or at least with double underscore methods, hopefully. So if you're writing something that's like a dictionary, you can do a double underscore get item on it, and then you can use dictionary access to try and assign to a descriptor. This is how we handle many-to-many -many fields. You know, if you've got a many-to-many -many field, you can say user.groups equals this list of groups, and magic happens, and it saves things to the database. That's done via a double underscore set in a descriptor. 
So we could say that I can pass in, that I can set a class, in, a class here, so I can say the vehicle.transaction is a part exchange, and the descriptor set would go, aha, you've just passed me a class that's not bound yet, so I'm going to instantiate that class, bind it onto the vehicle, and then give it to you back. And then if you access vehicle.transaction again, what you get is an instance of part exchange that's been initialized with the vehicle that we want. Equally, we could actually be quite clever here in the set method as well, and so and say, okay, well, if you pass me an instantiated one, but it's not the right vehicle, then I'll change the vehicle over so that I never have a part exchange object that's actually talking about some other car. A lot of detail to kind of get right here, but it works quite nicely. Why would you bother? Well, you won't need this level of complexity for the first couple of logical chunks that you're doing. If we only offered cash sales, it would be a complete waste of time to build something this complicated. But by the time you get five or six of these things, and you've got actually, there's, pro there's a process involved with selling the car, and there's a process involved with buying the vehicle, and there's a process involved with checking the vehicle over that happens by the engineering, by the mechanical department. And all of those have got three or four different implementations depending on what type of vehicle it is, or who you're selling it to, or who you bought it from, or how old it is. And you've got a lot of complicated processes to handle, and you've got four or five of them, and there are four or five different versions of each of those things. This allows you to keep um, all of your logic at the model level API, but you also have these existing APIs that you can test directly with instances of the object. And it keeps your code contained in nice little pockets where they are. It's an idea to think about. I want at some point to open source a library that does this very straightforwardly for you. It's just trying to decide on a nice API. If anybody's interested in this, come and talk to me at the sprints. Okay. Still with us? Good. Now it gets fun. Advanced prefetching. So. We're going to move on to a different part of the system. We've got two main views that we want to do, and these are classic examples of views where you need a prefetch related. So we've got what has happened to all the cars that were in for a service today. There were a bunch of cars, they were in for a service today, and we want to provide an uh, output to the manager, of the manager of the dealership that shows here's the car and here's a list of all, here's one car, here's a list of all the tasks that have been performed about that car today and who did them. Here's another car, here's the next bit, here's another car, here's, the next, here's their tasks. So it gives you all of that information together. And then we also want to look at the same data set from the other side as well. We want to know who are the mechanics, and for, for all of the mechanics, so what did Jenny do today? Um, we want to know what did Clara do today, and which cars was she working on, and when did that happen? So, now, as we said earlier, for performance reasons, when we're querying the table all the rest of the time, we don't have a core vehicle object. And the mechanics in the mechanics department are sometimes going to be working on a vehicle that's just come in as a used vehicle. Sometimes they're going to be doing the customizations on a new vehicle. And sometimes they're going to be doing servicing on a used vehicle. So we could have a used vehicle task and a and an owned vehicle task and a new vehicle task, and then somehow load, query all three tables and try and combine them together. But actually, we can identify which vehicle it is um, anyway. We don't need to know which table it was in at this point. Now, we're not going to use a generic foreign key, because generic foreign keys are evil. If you, don't, if you do use generic foreign keys, sorry, but they're generally regarded as a bad idea. Um, and in, in particular, it would allow you to say that the, the generic foreign key has no restrictions on it. So the database could say that this user had performed this task on the engineering department, which is probably not what you're going to perform an oil change on. You've got a task. It's going to have a straightforward foreign key to the employee. We're going to identify the vehicle via its registration plate. Again, woefully naive. People change registration plates, but it'll do. We're then going to have an action some notes, simple fields, and a timestamp that says when this happened. Great, we're off. So let's have a look at the APIs that we want to make possible. For the department's employee set, we want to be able to prefetch related the user's tasks, just the ones that they've done today. 
Now we're going to do this quite a lot, so we're going to encapsulate it up into a nice, simple custom class that we've got. We say we're going to prefetch related this stuff. Great. And then when we're doing the other way, we want the owned vehicles who were in for a service today, and we want to prefetch related the tasks that were performed on that vehicle. Let's do the user case first. This is fairly straightforward. We've got a foreign key. So all we're really doing is wrapping on top of the prefetch object. So who's now we've got a prefetch object. This is introduced in about Django 1.5, one version after prefetch related. And it allows you to customize the query set and a thing called the to attra, the, the attribute that it gets saved on on the parent child, the parent, the parent model once you've queried it. So we're going to create a prefetch object. It's going to have a simpler API. It's just going to take today only, default false. We'll create the query set where we're always going to want the query set of tasks. Um, if today only, then we'll do an appropriate filter on the query set. And then we'll call the parent with the three parameters that a normal prefetch needs. So the first one, prefetch task, that's a thing called the two attribute. So when you access one of the people, you will get that person will have an attribute called prefetch tasks, which is a preloaded list of tasks out of the database. And then you pass the query set that may or may not be excluding things that didn't happen today. And then we're going to want the task set, which is um, the way that we access that. So that's the related name. So you would normally do employee.taskset.all. That's the name that we've got in here. And that's it. That works. So Peeps are our list of people, department.employeeset.prefetch related. And you can see the first peep here has got two tasks associated with them. This works very nicely um, because it will only do two queries. We'll do one query against the people table, one query against the task table, join everything up in memory in Python. And if you've got 70 people who work in your department, it's going to be much more efficient to do it this way. Now, the vehicle case is a little bit more complicated because, as I've said, we've got all of these different tables, and we're trying to look up by registration plate, not by foreign key. So to start off with, we're going to want to be able to access the tasks associated with a, with a vehicle in the same way as we can do it from a user. So we want to be able to go used vehicle .task set is you know, order by the timestamp. OK, we can get certain operations, and we can do it for an owned vehicle as well. And this will query the database from an instance and get back what we want, just the same way as we do it otherwise. So we're going to need a manager. That's what user.taskset is. It's a related manager. Um, we're actually not going to subclass from Django's related manager here, because it gets a bit hairy if you do that. So we're just going to subclass off the base manager class. And we're going to instantiate that manager with an instance of vehicle. And we, we need to specify that the model is task, otherwise Django gets really upset if you don't have a model on the manager. We can then add the query set. So we've got self.instance, that's the vehicle. We can extract the registration plate, and we can filter self.model, which is the tasks, by the ones where the registration plate matches. Great. Now we're back to our friend, the descriptor. Here we can subclass from Django's built-in version. A reverse many to one descriptor is the task is the task set that we had a minute ago with an employee. If you access user.task set. Thank you. 